Welcome everybody to the SymbioBeta webinar. My name is John Cumbers. I'm the founder and the CEO of SymbioBeta, and it is an honor to be here broadcasting live from California on this beautiful, beautiful Wednesday morning. And I'm joined today by my good friend and colleague, Mark Bunga from Futurity Labs. Welcome to SymbioBeta webinar, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, hi from the moon where we're getting ready for beta space 2030. Good to, uh, good to see you. Uh, Mark and I have been doing this kind of thing for about 10 years now, monitoring the synthetic biology industry, keeping an eye on who's investing in what, what sectors are growing, what sectors are shrinking. And it's an honor to have you here on the webinar today to talk about our annual investment report, which we're going to get to in just a few minutes. Before we do that, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us live. If you want to type into the chat uh, where you are dialing in from, uh, it would be great to know that and to connect with you. And also, we're going to do a live Q&A right after we show you the big news out from the report. So really good to have everybody here. I want to share with you uh, what we've got going on uh, at Symbiobeta coming up, which many of you are coming to. We have over 1,800 people come into the Oakland Marriott in two weeks' time for Symbiobeta 2023. If you haven't already seen the website, I encourage you to go to symbiobeta.com. The biggest synthetic biology industry conference is back. It's the biggest, best event that we have ever done. We have more than 100 uh, sponsors and exhibitors taking part, four themes around human health, tools and technology, planetary health and biology and society. And we also have uh, 14 different tracks, everything from capital markets through to food and ag, through to chemicals and materials. So I'm very excited about the event that we have coming up. And um, if you also look, we have an amazing amount of speakers. Um, I was just on the phone with Thomas Middleditch, the actor from Silicon Valley this morning in preparation for his call. We also have Chion Wura, the member of the British parliament, Paul Stamets, from, um, who, uh, if you've seen the Netflix documentary about uh, mushrooms, magic mushrooms, fantastic fungi, uh, you'll recognize Paul. Uh, Craig Venter, Martin Rothblatt, and not one, not two, but three NASA astronauts are going to be coming to talk about synthetic biology in space. So I'm very excited about the event that we have coming up. And uh, if you haven't already bought your tickets, then please go on to symbibeta.com and sign up. It's going to be the biggest, best event that we have ever done. So with that said, it's time to reveal our annual investment report and the trends. I posted a survey on Twitter yesterday asking people to guess how much was raised in uh, 2022 and how much was raised in this quarter. And the answer was $10 billion. Just over $10 billion was raised by the industry in 2022. And in 2023, in Q1, uh, over $2 billion was raised. So Mark, um, help us understand this chart, because if we look at it and we look at this trend, um, I mean, to me, it, it, it smells of, uh, of burnt rubber. It looks like a crash <laughs> and burn here in the amount of, in, uh, the amount of money that poured into the industry, uh, particularly, uh, you know, this is showing over $20 billion in 2021, uh, and, then, and then crashing back down uh, to $10 billion. Uh, what, what's going on? Yeah, well, uh, you're right. I mean, the last few years have really been exceptional. Um, and uh, and that's not just for the synthetic biology um, space. You know, one of the things that we looked at when we first saw these numbers too, even actually last year in 2022, because it was such a change from the, the two prior years, is um, is this something specific to synthetic biology or is this something that's really happening across the board? So we also looked at um, global investment uh, uh, broadly in VC and in US in particular, US is the you know, far and away the largest single market for venture, venture capital and then plotted that out by, by quarter. So I think that's on the next slide. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So this is basically the same numbers, except uh, now it's having the, instead of having the quarter stack, they're all lined up one by one. So you can kind of better compare uh, quarter by quarter. And um, the gray line is global venture capital uh, since 2019. The black line is all sectors of U.S. venture capital. So those are both um, basically comparing synthetic biology uh, as a field on the left axis to the other two global uh, and, and US all sectors, which is on the right axis. So 150 billion, uh, uh, 175 billion for the, the global numbers uh, in 2022 and 2021 and 2020. Um, whereas this, you know, six, seven, eight billion is the uh, uh, quarterly numbers again for, um, for synthetic biology. 
So basically what you see here is that synthetic biology did exactly the same thing as all the other sectors of venture investment. It wasn't really any different. We could break it down. And in fact, that's what we're going to go do in a, in a second here is look at some of the subsectors within synthetic biology. But this is definitely not something that was only about synthetic biology turning into sort of a, like you said, burnt rubber. Um, uh, there was a huge flush of investment that was happening starting actually in late 2019. 2020, 2021 were record years and 2022 was still pretty good. Um, but 2022 and 2023, we're going to see how those shape up. And as Mark says, we're going to break down the sectors in just a second. And uh, it looks like the chat is disabled in the in the Zoom. So, um, Jeff, if we're able to try to enable that chat, that would be great. We can have people uh, people do that. Uh, it might be too late to enable it uh, for, for the live webinar. But if you have questions, then please do type them into the Q&A box and uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. So let's just jump back to this previous chart then, because um, it does show something interesting, I think, which is the amount of investment in the in the uh, in this quarter, two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. If you take out these giant these giant peaks, if you you know go back to when Symbi Beta started, which mm -hmm. was twenty twelve, um, two billion dollars is still an incredible amount of money that's going into into the industry. So if you mm -hmm. take out this this giant uh, uh, hype cycle here. Um, sure, it doesn't. It's it's not a continuing upward trend, but it's also not too shabby to see that amount of money still coming into the yeah. industry, given uh, how much pain the the general economy is in. Yeah, it's actually the best first quarter. In fact, I think it might be the best quarter overall uh, since, uh, if you again accepting twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty to twenty twenty two. If you on the next slide, that's a little bit easier to see because you can see that. You see that that very last bar on the right, that's taller than everything prior to 2020. So it's still yeah. pretty good. So we, we just erase COVID from it and, and, uh, and we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, governments were pumping a lot of money into things. Uh, Moderna, the vaccine was one of the Symbio, you know, highlights of, uh, of COVID. If it hadn't been for that, um, the U.S. would not have had a vaccine. Every single vaccine otherwise was produced someplace else. So, um, so synthetic biology kind of really saved the day there. And, uh, and uh, another thing that's been happening that we're going to get into is like why uh, there are, there have been a lot of basically successes in the synthetic biology space that were driving uh, investment, you know, beyond just what was happening with venture capital and government funding in general. And Mark, what are some of the tailwinds that are propelling the synthetic biology industry forward right now? Well, um, you know, as, as you said, we've been in this, you and I have been, uh, you know, working in this space for, for quite a while right now. My first sort of my inspiration to hit synthetic biology was about 2005 is an article uh, by Drew Endy. And um, that really made me kind of, you know, pivot my career to go into this space. Nice. And um, so, so watching it, you know, you've seen what was initially a lot of ideas about applications, but mostly just tools, mostly just getting, um, you know, the ability to um, to design uh, genes in software, for example, or to uh, automate lab processes that normally would be done by hand. Um, so all of those, all that tool building, really, you know, took a little while, and then we had some, you know, again, some of those ideas that uh, people would start to test. Uh, in the case of consumer products or medical products, get them through a regulatory process, and now those things are starting to hit the market. So we're seeing a whole flood of new companies come in that wasn't uh, really ready 10 years ago because the tools weren't ready. Awesome. I see that the chat is now open, so unleash your, your messages to each other, welcome each other, uh, do business together, tell us where you're dialing in from. And if we've got any questions, then uh, we'll ask them in the chat as well. Um, and uh, and we have a question. At what stage is the decrease being felt the most? Seed, Series A, Series B? Mm, you know, we didn't look into that uh, uh, specifically for this uh, this group for the last couple of quarters. So I can't answer that. But maybe if we have a little bit of a pause, um, I can do that. And if not, uh, if I can't do it in real time, um, I can do that as a follow up. Okay, great. Yeah. And and we welcome any feedback on this report. It's definitely uh, a work in, uh, continuous work in progress. And Mark also has a very interesting interactive dashboard, which we're going to make available to subscribers as well. So if you're interested in having early access to the dashboard where you can actually interact with all these charts and click on them, um, then uh, you can just drop an email to info at synbiobeta.com and uh, we will be able to get you early access to that. I think a couple of 
headwinds that I'm uh, tailwinds rather that I see supporting the continued investment in the sector is the recent Biden Harris administration a set of legislation that is promoting the bioeconomy both the inflation reduction act the chips and science the infrastructure bill they're all things that have good news in it for anybody who's building with biology and the second thing is the executive order which also is you know really focusing the US government on having a global bio strategy or a national bio strategy we've seen that happen in china we've seen that happen in the uk and in europe finally after 10 years of pushing a boulder up a hill the us is having a, a coordinated bio strategy and actually that allows me to plug the conference because we have the us government coming to the conference um next uh, in, in two weeks time and georgia lugardis who is the senior advisor at the white house who is coordinating the response to that executive order is bringing together a whole panel of government folks in the US to talk about it. And we also have folks from the UK, Dick Kitney is coming to talk about the UK's biostrategy. We have people from China, from Singapore, from Switzerland. So we're really seeing a lot of countries uh, get behind and put together a biostrategy. And what what what's that message sending to investors in this sector, Mark? Well, you know, the um, I think the big difference I'm noticing, this is more from a subjective point of view, is that uh, up until these these applications, you know, food and and fuels and stuff like that that investors understood. Up until those were available, um, you really had to kind of have been like a bioscience PhD to even know what this was about. It's like biotech was already sort of an advanced topic for most VCs, um, especially if it wasn't related to medicine. And um, so, selling things like tools and and other kind of uh, you know the the uh, the less sexy and also smaller market types of things. Um, uh, we're just not as uh, appealing to venture investors that, you know, they have a certain model where they want to, um, you know, get a, a certain scale of returns from their investments. And uh, again, the scientific community that would be using a lot of the earlier stages in bio uh, innovations just isn't very large, even though it's very important. It isn't a lot of people or a lot of companies. Right. And we're going to be going into that uh, this, into that sector breakdown in just a second. We have another question, which I don't think we can answer with this data, but I'll read it out anyway from Brian Meorella, who says, is it possible to break out investment going into R&D versus going to building manufacturing facilities? What is the trajectory of increase in total capital investment in bioprocess mm -hmm. manufacturing facilities? Yeah, um, that uh, I, you can definitely make an estimate of that. Um, the, in this case, this is venture investment. And so what you're typically seeing is the early stage things. Uh, so A and B rounds would be going towards usually towards R&D and then smaller uh, later rounds would also be going towards continued R&D. But generally, by the time you get to C and D rounds, investors are expecting you to be building something. And um, if that is something that does naturally need scale like again let's say food ingredients or fuels or some kind of a material something sold by the kilogram or by the ton then that would be going to capital like production uh, equipment whereas if it's something that would be again let's say software or lab automation things those would be those are still going to be smaller rounds and the the manufacturing you know facility to do that uh, is that's needed is much smaller so that could still be apportioned a lot to r d as well as to to manufacturing equipment and capital and Mark, as I said, you and I have been working on this for 10 years, and the yeah. classification of synthetic biology companies is one of the biggest uh, issues that we deal with. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. we're looking to constantly improve that classification system, and we're going to break those down in a second and talk about what we call the SynBio stack. You can see here, if folks are just joining us, this is the data that we published this morning showing the increase and the uh, and then the decrease, showing $2 billion invested in the last quarter, $10 billion in 2022. And if you add up over the last 10 years, it's over $50 billion that's been invested in the industry. Let's move on to the synthetic biology stack. Um, oh, sorry, just before we do, uh, talk us through this chart, Mark, uh, for those people who aren't familiar mm -hmm. with uh, with this, uh, help us understand what this what this chart's showing. Yeah, sure. So there's generally two two uh, basic ways that we look at how a particular market's evolving with regard to venture investment. One is what we just saw, where it's just the total amount. So all the companies in the space, how much they brought in in terms of venture investment. Uh, the other one is this chart, where you're looking at the the average amount of each of those investments, and then the number of of uh, transactions. So uh, in this case. The average transaction amount, the average amount put into uh, a given round of investment um, is the green bar. 
And as you can see, there was a point before about uh, 2012 where those numbers were pretty high, sometimes reaching up to like 25 million. Now, certainly not on average, but you did have these, you know, these big spikes that would bring it up to that level. Um, and uh, the number of transactions was really low. So you see this plotted, that's what's on the, the right-hand axis. So, you know, that was in the, basically in the like tens, 10 or, 10 or fewer transactions in those periods. So in other words, a smaller number of companies were sometimes getting very, very large amounts of money. Um, what happened again around 2011, 2012 was a real shift. And, um, and this is, I, I'm gonna say, John, not to, uh, well, not to, I, I'm gonna actually, <laughs> uh, blow uh, you know, sunshine and, and rainbows your way. I really think this is because the maturing of the community that was happening around that time uh, attracted a lot more uh, ideas, startups and investors. And so the number of people getting into the space really started increasing um, around 10 years ago. And, uh, and that was when it again became less of a purely scientific discipline and more of an engineering discipline um, and was looking more at products and, and things that could actually you know, generate revenue. So those companies that you see this huge takeoff in the black line, the number of, uh, of transactions um, starting around that time was when this became more of a, a commercially focused endeavor. And because there are more and more companies coming in, even though, as you saw, the total amount going in was, has been rising, uh, the number of, since these are newer companies, the, the amount that they're getting has been getting smaller. So uh, there was a little, you can kind of see that's kind of a dip. And now around 20, um, like 2018 or so, 2019, you see the, um, the average amount starting to rise again as well. And that's because those new companies that were started around 2011, 2012, starting getting past their A and B rounds and into C and D rounds and, and bringing in more money, basically. Uh, th there's a related question here from Steve Ma. Steve is at Cowan. There have been some large and oversubscribed later stage private rounds, series C's mm -hmm. and D's. What criteria differentiates the companies that are getting strong funding despite difficult capital markets? Mm. Uh, well, definitely when you're talking about those later rounds in, in this field, uh, they are they tend to be you know large amounts of money. And, and in particular, as we said, if they need to go into capital, um, you know, factories and, and production equipment, uh, that also is a lot. And this is really different from, let's say, software or, uh, or medicine, where um, the production facilities either aren't needed, like for software, it's you write once and then you distribute it freely, or in medicine, pretty much the manufacturing facilities already exist. Uh, even with you know, biomolecules, there, there are already plenty of places you can get those things made. Um, so the, the distinguishing factor here is that, that uh, companies have traction. Uh, in other words, they are um, uh, either at scale or they're close to being at scale. And uh, they can actually start selling products that people are going to be buying in existing markets at you know, uh, prices without too much subsidy. Um, you know, in the past, uh, there was a lot of subsidy that was driving um, demand for the products. And uh, as, as basically like in every field, solar and, and any other field you want to look at, the initial subsidy tends to go away once the, the industry reaches scale. Got it. And you're going to be able to download this report yourselves in a few minutes. We're going to send out an email to everybody with a link to go download the report. We have a few questions coming in. Una Ryan asks, how much investment in Synbio comes from Europe and other countries? I know that we mm. don't have it in, in, in the report, but uh, that, that is something that will be available in this interactive dashboard that you're working on. Is that right? Uh, yeah. And we actually... Um... Uh, we actually did do a cut of that data for uh, Fiona uh, just a few, well, about a week ago. And so okay, um, great. separately we have that and um, we could send that to Una if she, if she likes, send that to okay, her. Okay, great. And it's wonderful. I'm seeing people dialing in from the Philippines and from Germany and Scotland and Colorado and Barcelona and Melbourne and Canada, Chile, Mexico. So what an international crowd that we have. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And if you haven't typed into the chat uh, who you are and where you're coming from, uh, please feel free to do that. We have a few more questions. Steve Weiss, uh, good, to, good to hear from you, Steve, at Gray Heron and Genomatica. He has a question. Well, he wants to know if there's any data on M&A. And uh, certainly I don't we haven't got mm. it in the report this time. But uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, again, that's something that uh, we didn't put in the report. We're mostly looking at venture investment. Um, so M&A, who was acquired, you know, what are kind of, you know, what are exits looking like? We, um, we could find those things out. Uh, and same thing with, you know, venture investments, not the only type of investment that's important. Um, it, again, this is mostly focused, well, it's 100% focused on, on venture investment. Um, uh, but you would also look at things like, you know, where, where what's happening with grant funding and, um, uh, and uh there's a lot of you know, corporate partnerships and other things like that that aren't accounted for uh, in venture funding alone. Great. 
Um, let's uh, now break it down by sector. So we've got the synthetic biology stack. And if you're not familiar with the synthetic biology stack, we start at the basal layer with gene and genome synthesis. We then move up to BioCAD, that is tools and technologies, software tools, hardware tools, genetic tools for, for making biology easier to engineer. Then we move up to organism engineering platforms. And then at the top, we have the Symbio applications. And so if we look here, we can see uh, the lion's share of everything that's going on in the industry is in the applications stack. It kind of seems obvious, Mark, but tell us why that is. Yeah, so as I said, a lot of the things like BioCAD, you know, that software for designing uh, proteins and, you know, forecasting yield from, you know, new, uh, new processes you set up, things like that, gene th synthesis and sequencing, not something you can go to the mall and, and buy, uh, organism engineering platforms, these are all things that are really um, very, very important for the uh, R&D process, but R&D is still a pretty small chunk, you know, most companies, you know, spend maybe uh, between you know two and ten percent of their revenue in R and D, so everything else is going into production and into consumption. So that's what applications are all about. Um, these could be fuels, they could be foods, they could be uh, materials for textiles, and uh, so this is both uh, a uh, both larger markets and also more companies getting into those spaces. So um, if you look at, for example, the cultured meat space right now, there's lots and lots of companies looking at just about every type of Thing that we get derived from animals um, to eat or to wear or to use in some other way and trying to find an alternative to that. Great. We have a really good question from Na Nata Ranjan, who says, what about the COGS? What about the cost of goods sold? Mm -hmm. We are learning that the cost per pound or per kilogram to produce proteins is three to four X higher um, than traditional proteins. Uh, I'm not sure whether he means traditional mm -hmm. proteins or, or, or you know, the, the, the traditional way mm -hmm. of producing the molecule, but any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, COGS, cost of goods sold, is uh, basically how much you're paying for the material that you're then putting into a process. Uh, the other things you have to pay for are the labor that are going to produce the thing, the capital. So maybe you've got a special machine, you've got a factory, um, there's marketing and distribution costs. And so there's a lot of other things besides just COGS that go into um, uh, a, uh, the end cost. You know, the, in other words, either the cost that you can sell something for, uh, the, the, the amount that somebody will, will pay for a thing. So um, in most of these, in a lot of these applications, not all, but in a lot of these applications, the cost of the materials uh, that are going into it um, are uh, uh, a small fraction of the overall cost. So um, to you know, take an example, if you think about like your a car, which is mostly made of steel, the cost of the steel is actually a pretty small amount of the cost of the car. They actually spend more on marketing cars than they spend on steel. Um, so you have to look kind of uh, point by point on the particular product that you're looking at. If it's uh, usually if it's a, a plant product or an animal product, um, the again the cost of the material itself, the the cost of let's say the the inputs to making a carrot and so on are pretty small. A lot of the cost comes downstream in terms of like preservation and, and retailing and stuff like that. So there's no one simple answer to that. Uh, but I think it, if I'm going to project what I think you're asking is, well, are these products going to cost four or five times more because the inputs cost four or five times more? That's not the case. Uh, that input might add, say, 10 or 20 percent onto the cost, um, which is still a lot for some products. Uh, and so you have to look at um, what are the other things that will motivate people to buy a product that's new. Um, in this case, obviously, you'd be looking at the environmental benefits, the ethical benefits, if you care about the treatment of animals. Um, and in some cases, you would look at food security and local sourcing. So a lot of, uh, a lot of places that are looking at uh, having vertical farms or, or you know, doing brewed meat, whatever, um, you know, essentially culturing um, the products that they want to uh, consume. Uh, locally, it's because they don't want to be dependent on a, a, a long supply chain or on a maybe a, you know, a, a drought prone area is going to need some backups and things like that. And those costs also, I would say, have been coming down really drastically. So they might be three or four times um, in the particular case that you're looking at right now. But in general, uh, you know, that was probably 30 or 40 times just a few years ago. And we'll, uh, uh, in principle, could not only approach parity, but actually be cheaper. Great. And we have a number of sessions on scale up and buy manufacturing at the conference coming up this year. And we also have Meetable, which is one of the cell based ad companies in Europe that's going to be coming. They've got some big announcements on, on the cost of um, cell based ag. So very interesting. 
data that's going to be coming out of there. So let's dive into uh, some of these sectors. We talked about BioCAD, so you can see um, fairly healthy healthy uh, investment uh, over the over the um, time time frame in BioCAD. I'm not going to linger on on this one too long, but um, we can also see now the number of transactions. Um, and I'm curious what's going on here, Mark, because this, if you look at the BioCAD mm -hmm. chart, it's pretty much flip the opposite of the, of the main mm -hmm. chart, which I presume is a flip of the application <clears throat> sector. But yeah. Why would you see this? Well, uh, so y as you can see, whenever a chart goes up and down like this, uh, as much as, in, in fact, a lot of these do, it's because there are not that many transactions going on in, um, essentially, this is kind of statistical noise, you could say. So if you have a, a hundreds and hundreds of uh, transactions, then you wouldn't see such a jagged line. But as you see, we're talking about, you know, eight uh, at the most, eight or nine transactions, okay. actually, at the most, right? So from quarter to quarter, that's going to change a lot. So normally, what we would do, uh, just to make this a little bit you know, clear to look at is either um, since it would, didn't, wouldn't make sense to expand the size of the group, you could increase the size of the, you know, do this by year, for example, and that would show you a little bit uh, clearer trend. But, um, you know, in this case, there were some really remarkable, you know, in BioCAD, there were some uh, uh, in particular, uh, 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 Asimov had a, a 175 million Series B, so a really big, you know, investment on this one thing. So and they're spending are, some of that investment wisely because they're sponsoring the opening party uh, on the on the twenty third of May. So uh, yeah. glad to uh, glad to see that. Um, let's keep moving on. We've got gene and genome uh, synthesis, so we mm -hmm. do have more transactions in in gene and genome synthesis, I believe. Uh, no, we don't. No, so similar kind of uh, similar kind of jaggedness mm -hmm. here. Um, so we'll we'll move through these other subsectors um, and and get onto the applications, which is I think where the majority of the money is being spent. You can see here, this is the organism engineering platforms. These are companies like Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, companies like Arzada, companies who aren't necessarily making a product, but instead they are having a platform technology to, or, to engineer organisms that other people can use. So uh, now they may be using themselves. Amaris fits under this product as well. They do some contract work for other people. They do some products themselves. Um, but if we yeah. look at the... Um, John, just to point out something on that last one. So when we looked at BioCAD, you know, those... The scale on that chart, the top of that chart was about 50 million. Here's about 500 million. So right. just putting those things into perspective, this is a, a these have been much, much, much larger uh, amounts going into the space. Uh, organism engineering platform, Ginkgo in particular, has been obviously, you know, led there. Uh, Zymogen is also uh, really important in that space um, in the past. And uh, so, um, so this is, you know, this is basically back to what we were saying about creating a uh, platform where uh, we're not just doing science anymore, we're actually engineering and doing, you know, doing science at scale. That's what this space has really been all about. And obviously they use BioCAD and, and gene, gene uh, synthesis and sequencing <clears throat> to do what they do. Nice, yeah. And so we can really see then the, uh, <coughs> the transaction volume is, is high and, and it's coming back to that model of the average uh, amount early in the, in, the, uh, in the history of the industry followed by larger numbers of transactions later on in, in the last decade or so. Okay, let's move on to then the application space, which is where, as we showed, the majority of investment is, is taking place. Um, similar transaction model, um, 100, 100, peak of 120 transactions happening in 2021 there. Um, and then we now go on and break down uh, these applications into this pie chart that you can see here showing that the majority is going to health and medicine. Um, that is $1.4 billion. Now this is just in the last quarter, um, 141 million going into materials. Uh, I think Soligen uh, did a, did a, did a, I think that's included in there, uh, a fundraise. Uh, we've got some multi-sector applications going on 79 million, um, and we have uh, 54 in food and nutrition, 46 in food and ag, and then it tails off from there. Any any thoughts on this? I mean, the elephant in the room is the uh, is the, the biopharma industry, the health and health and medicine industry. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, you know that I think is also very uh, very typical um, in historically speaking. So biotech, I would say actually venture capital. Um, as we know it today, really started with biotech, and that was uh, with um, Genentech in the you know, 70s and 80s. The, the, the venture investment was very, a very different space, and Genentech 
uh, really, really change that. So, um, so health and medicine and, and, you know, red biotech, as we call it, uh, is still one of the main drivers of venture investment. It's, it, it's also the, uh, the part of Symbio that best fits the model that VCs like, which is once you've discovered a molecule, you're, you know, the, the pill itself costs a few pennies, but, you know, getting to the molecule, it has kind of the same leverage as, as software. With other things like materials, food, and so on, you have a really high variable cost. You have a, you still have to make the thing once you've discovered it. Um, and so it's less amenable to venture investment and it's a newer space. And I think a lot of the promise of Symbio in these spaces is that yes, by inventing the process or the machine or something that will allow us to say have beef without cows or, or eggs without chickens, um, those, are, those have the same type of promise basically that medicine does where the discovery then leads to a, opens up a huge new market. Um, I also want to point out space settlement here, uh, since John, I know you're a, you're a big fan, it's really important to you. So this is basically um, a company called Blue Aerospace that does biofuels uh, for rockets. Love and, it. And um, that's where uh, that 1.2 uh, million came in there. Great. And if people want to join our beta space event, it's going to be on the moon, May the 4th, 2030, and the early bird expires in 2025. So get those tickets while they are hot. Um, John, can I'm, we plug the uh, the interview that you had um, teleporting please, back from 2030? Please yeah. do. Yeah, that was yeah. a lot okay. of fun. Yeah. Uh, well, so everybody, um, if you're interested, uh, we produce a magazine. It's a luxury lifestyle magazine from 2030, where we interview people uh, today about where they are and their products and their ideas are um, set in that, that uh, actually pretty close future. 2030 is not that far away. And John was kind enough to give us an interview from Beta Space 2030 from the surface of the moon on May the 4th, which of course is Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. Awesome. And Mark, I should have given you a better introduction. Why don't you uh, tell everybody what Futurity Labs does? Oh, well, um, you know, we, uh, we do a lot of what you're seeing here, where we do a lot of the quantitative and statistical and kind of technical analysis of venture investments and patents and, and scientific papers and things like that in in these spaces of what are collectively called deep tech, so science-driven innovation. Um, but then uh, what we do on top of that is basically try and design solutions either you know, uh, for ourselves or with our clients. Um, so uh, it's kind of marrying industrial research and industrial design and putting it in one place. So intense is kind of our, our, uh, our way to have some fun and imagine 2030, but talk with people who are actually working on things and let them envision you know, what their life is going to be like and what the world will be like once their products have succeeded. Great. And Magda has posted a link to the magazine in the chat. So uh, okay, great. Magda. Magda's sitting right over there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I see a few questions, but what I want to do is get through the slides, and then I'm actually going to ask people to join us live, and they can ask you the question, and we can have a discussion. I've seen some good friends uh, uh, dialing in, uh, asking great questions. Esther Dyson, Carl Handelsman, Una Ryan, Jeffrey Otim from uh, Synbio Africa. So really good to see some familiar faces here, uh, Khalid Alem from Stemloop and, um, and, and Stephen from Eppendorf. So just really good to see so many of our community joining and I can't wait to see you all in a couple of weeks. So uh, looking at agriculture, um, so um, mm -hmm. any thoughts in terms of the investment in ag? And, and I guess, again, mm -hmm. you know, it depends what, I, there's the definition of synthetic biology of whether people are using GMOs, whether they're using CRISPR, whether they're using you know, more traditional methods. Um, and any thoughts on that as you analyze the ag data? Yeah, that's that's the, um, the thing. So each one of the companies in this space is, in a sense, unique. Um, and so bucketing them, even things like agriculture, they can be doing anything from like soil microbe uh, management. Uh, so looking at the soil microbe and maybe trying to uh, in, in do some probiotics or do some genetic engineering of the those microbes to you know create better conditions for crops to grow. Um, to, like you said, actually looking at whole organisms and engineering, say, drought tolerant crops or, uh, or treatments for those crops uh, that don't involve traditional pesticides. Um, and, you know, going back to the very, very beginning of this, uh, this, uh, this conversation where, you know, we see this, <clears throat> this really uh, long upward trend, this curve, it's really still just getting started. You know, a lot of the companies that are um, riding up that peak they're still, you know, they're investors, or sorry, you know, entrepreneurs who are in their 20s and 30s. And so they're going to have two or three more companies in their careers. 
and uh, they're going to be building on the stuff, the stuff that we, we see today. So, you know, agriculture, like I said, this is actually one of the toughest spots to get into in terms of being an entrepreneur, because one, you get to grow things twice a year, maybe three times crop rotations. Uh, it's an incredibly uh, uh, traditional industry um, in the United States and in a lot of other countries. The uh, sort of the, the users are family farms. Right. These are people whose, uh, you know, whose love of tradition is, is not, you know, not really like software where everything new is good. Uh, it's kind of the opposite. So this is a pretty tough one to get into. So the fact that, you know, there's, there's inroads, I think, is really remarkable. Fantastic. Uh, I see a lot of questions. Um, we're going to move to live Q&A shortly. So if you want to ask your question live, please use the raise hand function and allow, that will allow me to see uh, who I can pull into the webinar and you can chat with us directly. And we'll uh, come on to some questions in just a second when we finish the slides. Here's the here's the agriculture uh, automation and hardware. Somebody asked, where does that fit in? Um, so we can see again the growth in that. Um, we can see the transaction volume fairly low in that as well. Uh, chemicals and materials. You can see this giant uh, spike here um, that, that was the previous quarter. Um, I can't remember which uh, who that is, Mark. Are you able to... Uh, since it was in the previous quarter, it's not in this report, but again, um, I can I can look that up. Any any questions that we can't field during the live Q&A? Again, this is, I guess, tens of thousands of data points uh, that we're happy to follow up on. And it's great. we have more than 200 people uh, on this webinar, so it's great to see yeah. so much interest in this kind of I'll data. Be, As I said, it is something that we want to improve, and Jeff Bugaliskis um, is our new head of content. He's the one running this and uh, in charge of this. So Jeff, if you can make sure that you're capturing all of the chat and all of this, all of these questions, because there's some really good questions on uh, revenue and TAM and market size and things like that. So we really want to be able to capture all of this and improve on this when we do the next report. Yeah. And I'll be at Symbio Beta, of course, in Oakland in a few weeks, so we can talk there too. Awesome, fantastic. Um, and then DNA data storage. This is probably the, the smallest uh, application area that we have, mm -hmm. but uh, and here you can see the the uh, the investment here you can see the transaction volume. Any thoughts on this as a as a as a growing market? Um, you know DNA data storage. Uh, so as you see, there wasn't actually a transaction in Q1, um, but uh, you know this is a, a great example of something that is just barely outside of what we call the scientific horizon. Um, it's actually I would say it probably still is in that. So um, generally speaking, there's a, a process that all all innovations go through. They could be social innovations, not just biotech. They could be software, whatever. Is it? And the first thing is there's an idea. So if somebody has a, an idea, it's usually a bad idea. It's usually not workable. Like, hey, why don't we store data in DNA? You know, and DNA is made for storing data. Why don't we take, you know, let's say some type of uh, archival uh, data that we want to currently store with tapes, and we're going to see if it, DNA would do better because it's a intrinsically very good. Uh, medium for storing data, um, uh, and maybe we could make that work, but nah, probably wouldn't ever happen. And then people work on that for many years, and then finally they get an idea that's worth maybe patenting or looking at some venture investments. So you can see that only started happening around 2016 or so. Um, so that's where this idea, which is a very, very, very uh, crazy idea, but in the sense, the, the good crazy, right? If this pays off, we completely transform the way data is stored. But there's gonna, it's gonna, it's not gonna happen in two or three years to solve such a big problem. So, um, so that's what we see in in this space in particular. Great, excellent. Um, I think uh, it's very interesting, and there's a lot of new mm -hmm. in a synthesis technologies that are that are mm -hmm. coming out. So, um, um, now speaking of DNA DNA synthesis, uh, here you can see the investment in that sector, um, and you can see the the transaction volume as well. Uh, and we're not going to dwell on this uh, energy and environment. Um, these are all fairly small transaction volumes. Um, so it, they're all available in the report. We welcome any feedback and uh, both in the chat and via email info at symbiobeta.com. And I saw somebody ask the question about will the conference be live streamed? It won't be live streamed, but it will be recorded um, uh, and they'll be uh, available to the participants afterwards. So um Great. Uh, Una Ryan, you had a question. I want to see if you want to turn on your camera, join us as a, as a panelist, and we can invite you. And then I've invited a few other people. I see we have Christine Gould, who's going to be here. So I'm going to promote you to as a panelist as well. Hi, Una. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you. We can't see you. So if you want to turn on your camera, we'll be able to see you as well. I'm not sure. I, I usually am happy to show myself off, but I can't see the button for it. Can you turn me on? Um, Never yeah. mind. Let me ask my question. The reason I don't want to be a panelist is I'm going to have to leave fairly soon. But I have an important um, question for, for Mark. Mark, it was a terrific presentation and the data is amazing. I'd like to ask permission to borrow one or two of your slides, because I have to speak in Paris in about a month to um, the at an OECD ministerial meeting. So I will be with people who can actually enact change and uh, doesn't mean they will, but I want to be forearmed. So my question is, my bias has always been that only in the US do we fund beyond seed stage. I think a lot of countries mm -hmm. have seed funds and will start companies off. But a lot of the companies <clears throat> we've described, and especially in biopharma, need a lot of money later or five largest countries, because I think this is uh, why uh, synthetic biology and built with biology companies do so much better in the US. Yeah, you're, 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 I know it's more than intuition, but you're, what you're saying is, is absolutely correct. The U.S. far away leads uh, all types of venture investment, all sectors, um, but in particular in synthetic biology and anything that's, well, certainly medically related, um, but there are a lot of other fields that synthetic biology um, impacts that uh, historically have not gotten any type of funding outside of the U.S. It's, it's the, with a few exceptions, the U.K. is actually a notable exception. The U.K. also has a, a good bit of support by European standards, but you know, I'm so I live in Barcelona, um, and the the uh, the appetite for for that type of technical risk uh, outside of the U.S. is uh, nearly non-existent. People just don't get it, and um, I think some of it's also cultural, where you can still go to a lot of universities here, where the idea of doing something with or for a company or to to start a company is kind of anathema. You are you know you're joining the dark side, yeah. uh, and that that culture existed in the U.S. Uh, as well, maybe. 20 years ago. Um, I'd say it's changed a few places here again, like Sweden and in the UK. Um, but uh, certainly again, here in Spain, uh, it's, it's pretty uncommon. Uh, that's changing slowly. There's actually a really excellent um, uh, Synbio uh, conference uh, here in uh, happening in June that uh, I'm going to be speaking at that. Um, if anybody wants to come, I've got all the details and can probably get you a ticket. And Barcelona is amazing to come visit. Yeah. But uh, but it, it is now where, again, you know, John started his group uh, way back in the day, and, uh, and there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, foundations to be built. So I would be very, very, very happy to support you with uh, whatever you need for getting ready for that meeting. And um, so let's, let's talk offline, and, and we'll put that information together that you need. Thanks so much. Thanks, Yuna. Appreciate you dialing in. Uh, Christine Gould, do you want to turn on your camera and ask your question? Hi, John. Hi, Mark. It's great to see hey, you. Hi, can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks time. Fascinating presentation. And I appreciated that you pointed out the complexities of the agriculture sector and bringing some of these disruptive new technologies into the space. Um, one of the phenomenons that we're seeing is agri food tech is being repositioned as climate tech to kind of win back investors who have gone cold in recent years due to some of the, you know, market dynamics and complexities. So I just wondered if you had some thoughts about that and what you were seeing in your analysis. And I should say that Christine Gould is going to be co-hosting Symbiobeta with me in a couple of weeks. So uh, Christine Gould, wait. founder of Thought for Food, and awesome to have you, Christine. Thanks for the question. Yes, dream team for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, there's a couple of things I would also say behind that that uh, that shift, um, or let's say rebranding. And by the way, we should talk a little bit about rebranding before we wrap up. Um, so in Europe in particular, you know, talking about technology and, and agriculture is, it's just oil and water really doesn't mix for a lot of people, consumer wise, regulatory wise, and so on. And so there are a few really brave people uh, thought leaders uh, in and around Europe in the political and technical sphere that are really saying we need synthetic biology, we need other approaches to agriculture, uh, then, you know, we can't just all hope that we're going to have a bunch of hippie, uh, you know, organic biodynamic farmers that are going to save the world that just doesn't scale and it's, it's not realistic. 
Um, but uh, it's a very unpopular view, and it's going to take a lot of deprogramming of, you know, sort of uh, a rejection of, of GMOs and other technology in agriculture for that to change. Climate is one of the arguments that people can make for that. So yield, you know, we need more food, has not struck as strong a chord as, as climate, which is, uh, you know, is, I would say, around the world, a very, very strong uh, motivator for a lot of people, but definitely more so in Europe than in the United States. So I think that's, uh, again, rebranding, which again, John, if, if we have some time to talk about rebranding, I think that's an important thing, um, is, is really key. When any company, any technology scales up, you've got to stop calling it the thing you called it in the lab because not everybody's in the lab anymore. And you need a new name that sort of resonates with people. And we see that around like, you know, uh, uh, cultured meat is a much more um, uh, enticing way to describe it than cell-based meat or, you know, uh, murder-free meat or, you know, things like that. Uh, so we're still working on a lot of those names, but uh, individual companies and then the sector as a whole, I think really uh, needs to think about that. So let's do it. Thank you, Christine. Thanks for the call. Let's dive into the branding question now, Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we we always do with these reports is the you know the front half, the first half is really around um, the numbers and sort of the trends and specific companies and, and what's happened with them. But then the back half is really trying to summarize that and turn it into okay, so what do I do about that? And you know, I'm obviously want to know what the the funding climate is like, but my particular company is. Um, uh, maybe trying to raise money or just raise some money and what should I do with that? So in this case, uh, one of the things we did is looked at this theme of companies that have changed their name, that have rebranded. Um, and uh, that's more than just a name change. Obviously, it's uh, if you're into branding, it's about positioning and just, you know, the, finding the white space in the market to describe who you are and explain yourself to customers or investors. And so you can take some examples like um, Bolt Threads, for example. Uh, so making... Uh, they were started out making um, uh, uh, synthetic uh, spider silk and, and now have moved into mycelium and other products that basically uh, address the textile industry. And their name, I actually worked across the hall from them at UCSF many, many years ago when they were just starting out and had spiders running around the lab. Um, uh, and they were called refactored materials. And, and that's a, you know, it's a great name as a scientist. You're like, oh, refactored materials. I see you're like refactoring how materials are made or things like that. But it doesn't it's hard to even spell if you're not in, in the industry, right? So bolt, the, you know, we sell, bolt is a measure of, of cloth. You sell a bolt of cloth. And so bolt threads has this kind of, you know, punchy name. It sounds good. And it also appeals to people in the industry. They know what that means. And so- um, I never knew that bolt was a, was a term in the materials industry until now, there we go. Yeah, it's like, it's like a, an acre, you know, cord of wood, an acre of land. It's a bolt of, a bolt of, of, of textile. And the refactoring um, is also referring to the refactoring of a gene and changing the amino acid profile of a gene. So definitely, uh, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as your audience change, and before your audience is consumers or an industry buyer, like again, in textiles, it's probably going to be investors. So sometimes you need to change it to really explain yourself to non-technical investors. Um, and if you want to get outside of this, uh, you know, the, the sort of solid core of, of science-based uh, investors and look at um, more applications and, and things like that, again, thinking about rebranding is, is a good idea. So um, again, in the second half of the report that you can download, uh, we looked at some companies that have actually done that in the SynBio space. And then we looked at what are some general principles that uh, synthetic biology entrepreneurs can apply. Um, and again, as with everything else, if you have questions or things with the, you know, we can support you with, um, happy to, to take those on email or we can talk at, at the uh, uh, conference in Oakland in a few weeks. Okay, awesome. Um, Maria, why don't you go ahead and turn on your video, unmute yourself and ask your question. Why don't you introduce yourself as well? Hello, everybody. It's good to see you, John, and nice to meet you, Mark. Um, good to see I'm you too. Yes, um, I'm a PhD student here at UC Berkeley, uh, and I work with Jay Kingsley on machine learning and protein engineering, enzyme optimization for metabolic engineering. And I'm excited about advancements on AI. So is there any thoughts on software as a service and how is that organized on the Symbio stack that you presented? So excited, insightful data, thank you. Mm. Yeah, so AI, everyone's you know going crazy over AI. If you uh, 
have just peaked outside of the well if, you, if you've missed your late night comedy uh shows or anything like that because all the the hollywood writers are on strike it's because ai is coming for their jobs <clears throat> and it's really funny because when ai comes for scientist jobs they're like what you mean i don't have to do that you know by hand anymore in matlab or something they're thrilled because they get to be faster better smarter scientists and um i think that uh, the the wave of ai that we're seeing right now outside of uh this space so again like mid journey and, and chat gpt and stuff like that uh we're working with that really closely and i'm um, and have been actually for a few years um to to basically understand the limitations so actually the magazine that i mentioned earlier intense the first issue was written about 50 percent completely by, by ai um and uh and so you you basically it's good at writing uh boilerplate text uh and come up with some you know some interesting ideas that you might not have thought of but it's i think it's really hard to see how that's going to change science with the general models that have been released so far. So what we're doing right now, um, and I'm really, really excited about, so this is just a preview of something that we're coming up with, is we're training uh, one of those models. We're building our own version of it, and we're training it on um, uh, tens of thousands of uh, patents, scientific papers, startups, and things like that. So it'll be able to answer actual questions with facts about the synthetic biology space uh, and related things too. So um, uh, I, I think that, um, those tools are evolving so quickly. You don't know exactly where it's going to be in the future, but I do know that the, the first step is to, you need to have it spe specifically trained on the topics that you're interested in, or else it's just going to spew out a bunch of nonsense. Awesome. Thank you, Maria. We have a great uh, comment from Chandru, uh, who, sa who says, uh, as Doug Cameron recalls, that's the, uh, that's the investor, the most important omics in SynBio is economics. <laughs> So how successful are companies in the marketplace so far, or are these solutions in search of a problem to solve? I definitely don't think there's solutions in search of a problem to solve. There are, there are massive problems that they're aimed at solving. I think you know, there's a question earlier about the, the, cost of, uh, the cost of materials and other parts of the process and how competitive that is with uh, incumbent processes. And that, that really is a, a question because everybody here um, and probably everybody we all know is really committed to you know they're happy to pay more for something that's environmentally friendly um, or maybe we want to be the first people to try something so we're like you know early adopters and we'll pay more for that um, but it is uh, shocking how little uh, the general public cares about almost anything there's a there's a, a sort of a market uh, a saying that you know when did the sales of color films surpass the sales of black and white when they cost the same so even something that seems like a pretty massive improvement uh, still has a hard time demanding a, a price premium for most of the buyers. So, um, so yeah, I think that the, the, uh, the getting things that work at all is kind of where synthetic biology has been and now getting them to work uh, at a lower cost or with higher performance or other things that the markets will pay for, that the economics makes sense for, that's the challenge that lies ahead. Right, and you'll see at Symbi Beta this year, for those of you who are attending, a lot of products out there in the market. You've got things like Lanza Tech uh, producing, have a partnership with Lululemon. Uh, Genomatica has another partnership with Lululemon. Uh, Checker Spot is producing their skis. So there's a lot of, of products out there in the marketplace. Um, now, still, a lot of them working on the unit economics and, and working mm -hmm. on this, this capacity yeah. issue for fermentation, which a lot of people are trying to solve as well. Yeah. Well, and that's why you see going like Lululemon premium brand, me people buying yoga pants for 120 bucks or whatever, 200, I don't know what they cost, but yeah, then they're, they're also paying for those, those uh, ingredients that are better for the environment or, or higher performance or just cool. Yeah. Um, Esther, you wanted to, uh, if you want to unmute and yeah. uh, you wanted to um, comment on the AI discussion. I hope I'm unmuted. So the, the thing about large language models is they're actually large pattern models mm -hmm. and or you could say molecules are a language but mm -hmm. you know the the use of them in synthetic biology goes sort of beyond looking at patents and papers but actually i mean in a sense what we're doing in synthetic biology is very fast evolution and it's very directed mm -hmm. but if we could now just like look at the molecules and, and what works and sort of how proteins fold and how 
receptors work against one thing versus another. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me seems to be the more interesting application of this. And I th think there's some people doing that and that, mm -hmm. anyway, comments on that. Yeah, well, so there's, I think generally with AI, you've got two broad approaches. One, like you say, is pattern matching. And the other one is you have a mechanistic understanding of how something works and you can just perform that calculation at scale. Um, and depending on the, uh, the specific application, one or the other is going to do better. Um, I think with, uh, with the pattern matching, again, you, um, I've, I've seen this in a lot of different industries where let's, I'll just take a, to make a really simple example. If you looked at um, the correlation between height and weight, you would, you know, you'd find a, a certain distribution among people. Um, and so you could then sort of make some predictions based on just those two numbers. But if you understand- Which is you know, statistics, how, it's not even patterns. Yeah. What I mean is that if you, um, uh, if you looked at the, so if you just looked at the correlation, if you just look at a pattern, you're going to say, well, this is the, you know, these yeah. two variables are correlated in a certain way. If you know, you know, why people grow and what their, you know, how their age corresponds to their height and some other things like that, even gender, then you can start to have a more, a little bit more mechanistic understanding and predict things that aren't just existing in a pattern. So um, I don't think those are, you know, they're, uh, I, th I think they're very complementary approaches, but if you understand the mechanics, if you, if you know the formula, basically, then that's a better way to go about that. And we haven't had that yet for um, like really complex systems like protein folding and things like that. Except I think we're about to because of these large language models, which was my question. Yeah, and, no, like I said, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. I, we, I agree with you. Yeah. We have a ton of companies coming to Symbi Beta talking about large language models. Absci has a zero shot algorithm for antibody design. Cradle Bio uh, is working on this. Profluent is working on this. So there's a, a lot of sessions uh, at the conference this year on generative AI. And on Wednesday night, there's going to be a birds of a feather for all those people who want to talk about generative AI okay. for biology. So, um, so do, you, do, you, do you have a chat GPT in-house that could tell us which companies we should go listen to on that topic? Hmm. Yes, I will, send you a, uh, I will send you a list of them. Thank you. Um, uh, Nimi, why don't you ask your question really quick because we're running out of time. I apologize. No problem. No problem. I can go quickly. Um, so my question is more on the cosmetic and the chemical side, which is very little right now with medicine occupying most of it. Uh, do you see some trends which, uh, which are about like some companies getting funded in this space and, <clears throat> and what does it look like for mm -hmm. the next year and so on? Yeah, so cosmetics is a really interesting space because, again, it's one of those places where people pay absurd amounts of money for um, for products based on not just you know the actual performance, which is very hard to really statistically measure, even though they they say that you know this will de-age you by ten years or whatever. Um, it's very much sold on packaging, promising branding, and stuff like that. And um, so it's a it's an area that makes a lot of sense for companies with an expensive you know buy volume product to go into. If your thing costs ten dollars a gram, there aren't that many markets that you can sell that into, and cosmetics is one of them. Um, uh, and this. Again, I saw this with nanotechnology. You see this with like digital things. You know, um, uh, the metaverse and cosmetics was a was a big space uh, about a year ago. So it's kind of an early adopter of everything because that's what helps it differentiate itself towards its customers. Um, and I think it's a good place for if you have a again a material that you can sell into there. It's a great starting point. Um, it shouldn't be your ending point though. You're going to need to look for larger scale markets and longer term I think value because they tend to move on to the next shiny object really quickly. Fantastic. I didn't know that cosmetics was an early uh, entry for, for a lot of things. That's really good to know. This has been a fantastic webinar. Thank you, Mark, for working hard on pulling together this data. Thank you, Jeff, also for editing it and putting together the webinar. Thank you all for joining. We'll be doing more of these in the coming few months, and we look forward to seeing as many of you at the Symbi Beta conference in a couple of weeks. And many of the speakers were on the call today, Carl Handelsman, Una Ryan, Esther Dyson, uh, many other folks are all going to be there at the conference. So look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks again, Mark, and we'll yeah. see you all Thanks soon. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye now.